I've been waiting for a while to be able to justify making a Dragon's Dogma 2 video on the main channel. I've just been waiting for a little drip of information or something I can latch on to to justify making this. And we're here. Today's the day because a bunch of previews just dropped. A bunch of people got the chance to play about three hours of the game. And what they found out is quite interesting now you guys know me i like to do skeptical deep dives of games for which i am particularly excited or interested and dragon's dogma 2 to say the very least is intriguing to me the original dragon's dogma didn't really hook me but every time i found out more and more about dragon's dogma 2 i've only grown more interested in case you somehow haven't heard of it it is an upcoming action role-playing game developed and published by capcom it has a vast open world lots of secrets to be discovered monsters to be hunted and killed, and seemingly a pretty interesting narrative at its core as well. In addition to that, it is an incredibly robust action RPG, meaning that there are tons of different play styles, loadouts, and ways to specialize your gameplay based on the play style that you enjoy most. Now, whenever we do one of these skeptical dives into a game, I think it's important to establish just what that means. All skepticism is, is not being convinced of a thing until there is sufficient reason to believe and accept that thing. So in the case of video games, you don't buy into the hype or excitement of a video game until there is sufficient reason and evidence to buy into that claim. In this way, I think it's perfectly reasonable to be excited for something like GTA 6 because Rockstar really seems to know what they're doing. On the flip side, if they announced that they were going to do another Gollum game, I think it would be reasonable to doubt that game's quality. Simply because the evidence for one being on Awesome greatly outweighs the evidence for it being bad, whereas in the case of Gollum, the evidence for it probably being a terrible sequel to an already terrible game is pretty overwhelming. And in the case of Dragon's Dogma 2, over the last year or so, we've seen a lot of this game at various preview events, journalists have written articles on it, IGN has published gameplay of it, and some of those showings have been better than others. At times, the capture that's been published has been of remarkably poor quality, whether it's just lower resolutions, bit rates, or frame rates, we've seen it all. There's also been questions of polish, difficulty, balancing, and there's been announcements of, let's just say, bold choices when it comes to the game's direction, such as there being almost no fast travel system at all within the game, and instead the developers are relying on players running around on foot to get every in this massive open world they've created. These are all really interesting and important questions that need to be delved into, and thankfully we got a ton of answers as a result of the previews that just had their embargoes lift today, at least when I'm filming this, I guess yesterday when you're probably seeing this video. So we're gonna go through all of it. I'm gonna look at the stuff that I think is worrying about Dragon's Dogma 2, but more importantly, I'm gonna go through the stuff that they've shown in the last day or so that really gets me excited and makes me think that this could actually be something really special. No sponsor today, I just ask that if you enjoy the video, you hit the like and the subscribe button. Easy enough? Cool, let's get into it. Now the first question I and everybody else had was with regard to the frame rate, because this is the one thing that's been omnipresent in all of the footage. The frame rate's been really all over the place in all of these captures, and up till now, Capcom has just not wanted to talk about it. Well now, not only do we have testing from IGN, but we also have clear and concise statements from Games Director on how the game is targeted and what it's set at. As you can see here, Jason Hidalgo from the Reno Gazette Journal asked very, very directly, will Dragon's Dogma 2 have the option for 60 frames per second on consoles. And the game director said, we'll feature uncapped frame rate performance around 30 FPS or above on consoles. For PC, it depends on the specs of the machine, but for consoles, we're aiming for an uncapped frame rate around and above 30 FPS, which is not ideal. For one, 30 FPS is not what a lot of people were hoping for with an action RPG. They were hoping for maybe a performance mode going up to 60. I can live with 30, some of the best games ever made run at 30 frames per second, whether you look at Red Dead or Tears of the Kingdom, Breath of the Wild, games like that, Skyrim, all of them, uh, The Witcher 3, they all ran at 30 FPS at launch. And so it's not like uh, totally unacceptable. You can have a great game that runs at 30. However, it's the uncapped part that worries me 
because uncapped can sometimes mean that you get 40 frames per second. It can also mean that sometimes you're dipping down into the 20s and it definitely means that you're bouncing between all of those. And that can be really, really jarring. For me, it makes me motion sick. When I play a game that has extremely wide ranges of frame rates, sometimes in the 40s or high 30s, and then it dips down into the 20s, that makes me and my brain freak out and want to puke. So for me, this is kind of like a major, major red flag. See? I didn't have this sitting there for nothing. No, but seriously, for me, it's just something that would probably prevent me from getting this game on console, unfortunately. And IGN actually tested this and shared their results. And as you can see, they were playing on PlayStation 5, and at times they're in like the mid to low 30s while exploring out in the open world, playing on console. And then at other times, you're gonna see them go into combat and the frame rate drops into the mid 20s. Now again, the game can still be very, very good. People watch movies at 24 FPS all the time and don't have a lot of complaints, but I do think it's just very important you know what you're getting into. I've seen people in like the, the Dragon's Dogma subreddit speculate that maybe there was gonna be a performance mode and they were just waiting to reveal it till later in the marketing cycle or something. But at this point, it seems very clear we're close to launch. People have played the game for multiple hours and the game director has clarified they're targeting 30, well, specifically what he said is around 30 frames per second and above, and it's uncapped. So sometimes it's gonna go higher, sometimes it's gonna go lower. I'm not gonna make the decision for you, I would heavily recommend if you can play the game on PC, if you are fortunate and blessed enough to have a quality gaming PC that could run this game, I think that's definitely the place to go. This is not like an Elden Ring situation where the PS5 and PC performance is kind of up in the air and it's just pick your poison. In this case, it's very clear cut. PC is probably going to be the best way to go. One of the other questions that's come up with the game is whether or not this will be accessible to people who didn't play the original game. As I mentioned at the top, the original game was not played by very many people. It was pretty polarizing. People either loved it and it was basically a cult classic or they just totally, totally hated it and thought it was too clunky and not that interesting. However, Dragon's Dogma 2 seems to make the formula much more accessible. And one of the interesting ways that we know this is that IGN, to their credit, sent Destin, somebody who by his own testimony only has a paltry 70 minutes of game time in the original Dragon's Dogma. So somebody that tried it, it just wasn't for them. And he went to try this preview event and play the game for three hours and absolutely loved it. It turned him into a convert. And that's what I like to hear, that even for outsiders, the game is winning them over. Because in case you're not aware, like how these preview events always work is that these journalists are usually sent based on their previous resume of games that they've covered or games that they enjoy. Which makes sense. If you're the head honcho over at IGN, why would you send somebody who loves Mario games exclusively to a preview event for the new Elden Ring DLC? It just wouldn't make any sense and they probably wouldn't have that much constructive feedback when all was said and done since it's just frankly not the kind of game they would typically play or or enjoy. And so what inevitably happens is that at these preview events, you get sort of a skewed narrative. It's why you can have a bunch of journalists go to a preview event for something like Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League and have mixed opinions or even positive opinions before the game releases to overwhelmingly negative fanfare. Can you say negative fanfare? Is it still fanfare? If it's negative, I don't think that makes sense. I don't think that makes sense. It, it, never mind. But you get the point. You get what I'm trying to say. When you have a bunch of people that like looter shooters going to try a looter shooter, they're more likely to enjoy that than somebody who doesn't play those types of games. Makes sense. Easy peasy, not rocket science. And often for sequels, you're going to end up with journalists going to try the sequel early who really enjoyed or at least had a lot of experience with the original. And while I think that's a useful way of doing things and it makes sense because you're trying to win fans over to the new game, I do think it's useful to also put somebody out there to try the game who doesn't have a lot of experience in the franchise so that they can represent a perspective that might be valuable to somebody who doesn't have experience with the franchise either. For me, I'm looking at this as somebody that didn't really connect with the first game either. And so seeing that somebody who didn't connect with the first game really enjoy the second game gets me all the more excited. It's another reason why having different perspectives review games and discuss them can be really, 
really helpful to the everyday consumer. And I also think it's worth acknowledging that it's useful when a journalist doesn't just pretend like they've experienced everything and they know everything, but when they can just be upfront and like, hey, I haven't played the previous games or I tried the previous games, I didn't really enjoy them. Here's my perspective. Now that you know my background with this franchise, with this genre, whatever, now that can inform your interpretation of my article I'm writing or of the video that I've made. It's why I try really hard when I'm talking about these games to make my biases and prior experiences very, very clear for everybody, just so there's no question at all. So all told, I'm very happy to say that the game seems to be very welcoming to new players in a way that doesn't dumb down the experience. The game is still by all reports quite difficult and challenging, and there's a lot of content here for new players and old. Now, one of the most interesting things about the game for me has been that they are taking some very somewhat novel approaches to the game's design. They are unapologetic and bold in some of these design choices. For one, they have largely avoided fast travel. There are some cases where you can like pay to directly travel to another town, kind of like on the back of a wagon, but that's pretty rare. Almost all of the time when you are navigating the world in Dragon's Dogma 2, you are going to be running on foot. And this got a lot of people a little like freaked out because they immediately started thinking of other open world games where running on foot might lead to very boring or prolonged periods of nothing interesting happening. But this is kind of the magic of a design choice like this. If you establish early on in development, there's not going to be a lot of fast travel. There's not going to be like super fast mounts or anything. You're going to run around on foot. When you establish that clearly early on, you are freed to design the world, assuming and knowing that players will be traveling on foot. And that means that interesting things can be placed more dynamically and densely in the world because they know that you're going to be traveling on foot. It means that they can design cool little puzzles and alcoves and caves and stuff into the mountainside because they know you're going to be going through there on foot slowly enough that you'll notice it. Whereas if you were on like a super fast mount or if you were fast traveling by, you might not have ever noticed it. And this is why I think some of the best games in terms of open world design click with some players so incredibly deeply. And that is because when you have a game that is so confident in its layout and design, it also leads to a situation where developers are trusting the players to explore and create meaningful discoveries and moments for themselves. It's the difference between that Ubisoft style of open world design where they just flood the map with little collectibles and things to pick up because they think if they don't do that, players will just be bored because there won't be stuff. So they have to like hold your hand as you explore the world by being like, ooh, piece of candy, piece of candy, piece of candy. But with games like this, it seems like they're taking an approach to just trust the player, open the doors out into the world and say, go crazy, run around, find cool stuff. And that's made all the more clear with another thing that's been revealed in the last month or two. And that's with the Sphinx. The Sphinx is a sort of monstrous character you can find in Dragon's Dogma 2, but emphasis on can. They've made it very clear. There will be many players who go through the entirety of Dragon's Dogma 2 and never discover the Sphinx. They won't ever find her. It will take a lot of know-how, careful evaluation. It will take puzzle solving skills and things in order to find her. And it will take even more know-how and wit and intelligence to be able to get the rewards and things that you can win as a result of solving the riddles that she presents players. And that to me, I don't know, it's so cool that they're for one confident enough in the amount of content in the game that they can have something like this that's really epic and cool that some players will just never see, never encounter in their entire run simply because it's hidden that well and they trust players to find it and that's also something that's doubly interesting to me simply that they're willing to hide this thing in the game because they're confident enough in the way the game is designed and the world is built that they know players will be able to find it if they look hard enough and are dedicated enough now on the flip side this could be total bs and crap it could be like oh yeah you have to go to this cliff edge and then put in a 15 digit series of ups and downs on the D-pad and then it'll open up a portal and then you end up there. How you would know how to do that, I don't know, but you'll figure it out. That could suck and I wouldn't love that. But 
if it is something where it's just a matter of cunning and wit and perception and if you're always aware and you know kind of where to look for interesting things in the landscape and stuff this could be super super cool and now the entire time that I'm playing Dragon's Dogma 2 when the game launches I'm going to be looking around every cliff face every rock really being hyper aware of everything around me to see if I can stumble onto the sphinx and you better believe if I do stumble on that sphinx it's going to be a rush of dopamine unlike any other because I will know I overcame a great challenge that other players will not be able to overcome and that I think is the magic of confident game design and game design that's not trying to be everything to everybody that's not trying to hold everybody's hand to the extent where everybody's going to have the same cookie cutter experience and go through the same series of experiences over and over and over again they're like yeah some players won't find this yeah sucks to suck I guess <laughs> <laughs> I just find that badass. <laughs> Another interesting revelation and very bold design choice was that the game will only feature one save file. And initially a lot of people were like, oh, this is like a technical constraint on consoles because the verbiage has always been on console. Players will only have one save file. I don't know if that's because on PC you can kind of cheese it by saving it in a separate folder and swapping them i don't really know if that's what they're referring to when they separate the two but initially people were worried that this might be like a technical restriction or restraint but it's actually a very intentional one on the part of the designers what the game's director said was quote it is indeed one save file however the game gives you more options it gives you the option to load from the last inn you rested at so in that regard it's not a game where you won't have any possible way to go back say you were in a boss fight or you were exploring out in the world and then you get jumped or something happens and you're in one of those unwinnable situations without multiple save files or quick load quick save systems you would just be screwed normally and basically soft locked however they want to be clear that you won't get soft locked like that you will have the option to load back into an inn or tavern you previously rested at but that's still probably not the solace that some people were hoping for but he goes on regarding what the thinking was behind that it's really simple we want to encourage exploration and this is quite the opposite of what you get when you allow too much freedom in this regard he gave the author of this article an example involving a cliff if you are at a cliff of discernible height with multiple save options like the ability to save right there and quickly reverse back to it you might just jump off to see if you can make it quote that has quite the opposite effect of encouraging that exploration feel he says however with just one save file your thinking should shift jumping might result in death or unwanted damage and that could be a setback of course you can reload at the last in you saved at but given how big dragon's dogma 2's world is and how hard it could be to fast travel at times you might not want to retrace your steps so instead of jumping without thought you might analyze the cliff's height more closely or even decide if you can find a safer way down quote so that's the main reason I really wanted to encourage the thrill of exploration and that was the thinking behind the limit it's basically an attempt to avoid save scumming which is an age-old issue in RPGs where when people have the ability to save scum they will right before a big narrative moment happens they'll quick save try one dialogue option and if that fails try another after they quick load back and they'll just do that again and again until they get the desired outcome which sort of defeats the purpose of having branching narratives and stuff and like persuasion checks and charisma rolls if it doesn't matter because you're just going to quick load anyways but in the case of exploration it's interesting because they're actively avoiding exploration being interrupted by save scumming which is not normally when you hear about save scumming being an issue it's normally with regard to narrative like big plot points and things so it's really interesting to hear the thought process behind it and I actually think that this makes a good bit of sense if you're trying to immerse players in this world it only makes sense that you would double down on that and try to find ways to keep them engaged at all times because when you quick save jump off a cliff die and then just quick load and, and nothing really happened there was no real consequence to that decision you made it might be quick but it is still effectively a disruption in that immersion it might only be 10 seconds while you load back in but it still is a disruption 
And if they can keep you immersed, if they can keep you feeling like you're actually exploring this world for real, I think that's going to lead to much more impactful and memorable occurrences when you discover something really cool or when you're adventuring and something awesome happens. Not to mention that we've all felt that stress in a game like Elden Ring or Dark Souls or whatever Souls-like game you want to reference, where you are out exploring the map and you're low on health, you're out of heals, your Estus flask is just drained and you are desperately looking for a campfire or a site of grace to rest at and save at. You're desperate for it and you're hoping beyond hope it's right around the corner, but you're around the corner and it's not there and your heart sinks, but you're like, I gotta figure it out. You'd be like, oh, I'm carrying so much or I have so many runes in Elden Ring and I just need to find a place to, to rest at so that I don't lose it all. That gets your heart pumping and I can think of right now, multiple times in those games where I was this close to dropping dead and I just barely recovered and found the sight of grace just in time. And those exciting moments, those sort of emergent moments of fun and, and excitement are pretty rare, especially in games that hold your hand too much. And Dragon's Dogma 2 seems to be a game that is totally unafraid of letting go of your hand and being like, yeah, go explore hopefully you have fun but you might stumble onto a train track and get run over you might find a bear but go have fun in this case you might actually find a bear and uh that would actually be a moment that was like fun so <laughs> i guess that's not necessarily a bad thing in this context the analogy kind of falls apart i'll be honest <laughs> and other questions such as the scope and scale of the world and gameplay time have also been answered as a result of this preview with the game's developers saying that it's roughly the same length as the golden run in the original dragon's dogma which would put this game at roughly 40 hours and maybe a completionist run around 80 to 100. but when you consider the extremely varied build types and the different play styles that they support, I would not be shocked at all if you were able to get hundreds of hours out of this game. And more than anything, all of the previews, everybody who has tried this game that I have seen has nothing but positive things to say about it, and all of them are itching for a chance to play again. And that is exactly what you would hope to hear from a preview event. Now, does that mean that the game is a 10 out of 10? Not necessarily. It could, it could. 10 out of 10 games tend to also preview really, really well, but it's not a foregone conclusion, especially when we see a couple of things that might cause a little bit of concern, such as frame dips and issues such as the uncapped frame rate. However, all told, I think that there is a whole heck of a lot of things going in favor of Dragon's Dogma 2, suggesting that this could be something really, really special and cool, really bold design choices, really confident game design, extremely overwhelmingly positive impressions from media and journalists from all over the world. And I think all of that greatly outweighs the couple of concerns that we have. I think that Dragon's Dogma 2 is shaping up to be a game that's going to be in contention for game of the year, especially with the schedule as we know right now for game of the year contenders and i'm here for it let me know what you think of dragon's dogma 2 in the comment section below are you going to be playing it yourself is this intriguing to you or do you still have questions and concerns about it let me know because i may or may not wink wink be able to push and uh prod ask some questions and find a way to get an answer to one of those questions so ask below and I will try to pull some strings and uh, figure out answers to them. And as always, if you have direct questions or things, come over and say hi to me at Luke Stevens Live, my second channel where I stream and post live stream clips and basically any video that doesn't end up on the main channel ends up over there. And we do a lot of them. There's like five to 10 videos a week over there. So if you want more of me, for whatever reason, you can find it there. But that's gonna do it for me. Thank you for watching. I love you all dearly. I'm excited to play Dragon's Dogma 2 and I'm hopeful the game is not poopy. So here's hoping, fingers crossed. Stay safe, everybody. I love you all. I'll see you in the next video. Hugs and kisses. Bye bye